In today's video, we'll lay out the actual clear definition of REST and what counts as a RESTful API. By the end of this video, not only will you know, maybe for the first time, what a REST API actually looks like, but also why you're never going to write an actual REST API. If you're new to the channel, then welcome. My name is Amichai, and in this channel, I talk about software architecture, design patterns, best practices, things that you really want to be familiar with if you're a software engineer. This video is part two in a series of videos in which we're building a REST API completely from scratch using ASP.NET 8 and various other best practices and latest features, etc. So smash the subscribe button if you want to see the upcoming videos in the series. But in any case, this video can be watched standalone from the overall series. So let's start with what is REST and why it's so misunderstood. So REST was invented by this guy called Roy Fielding. And this was back in 2000 while he was working on his dissertation. Now, before we look at what he actually defined as REST and the actual definition of what REST is, it's important to understand for context that this is in 2000 and just a few years before this, let's say 1993, then this is when the web is starting to become a thing. So what are the six guidelines that Roy lays out for an API to be considered RESTful. So here's chapter five of Roy's dissertation. And over here we have the definition of REST. And over here he lays out the architectural style. Okay, now real quick, let's go over all the six constraints of REST so you're familiar with them. Number one is client server, and this should be pretty straightforward. So on one side we have the client, and on the other side we have the server. And basically what we're doing is we're separating the user interface concerns from the data storage concerns. This line over here represents information being transferred over the internet, over the World Wide Web. And this simply represents two applications where on one side, you have the side that's responsible for the user interface. And on the other side, you have the server with the various logic that you have and the underlying data access. Next, and this is one of the most important constraints, we have stateless. What stateless says, is that the server does not store any state about the specific clients in between requests, meaning that when the client goes ahead and makes a request to the server, the request itself has the information, the context needed to go ahead and handle this specific action. Next, we have cache. Cache is the constraint in which the server, when it returns a response to the client, then it has to specify as part of the response if it's cacheable or non-cacheable. So pretty straightforward, if it's cacheable, then you can cache the response. And if it's non-cacheable, then you can't cache the response. But this constraint says the server must explicitly define the response or explicitly label it as cacheable or not cacheable. Okay, next we have a uniform interface. And this is the most interesting constraint and the reason behind why almost any of the APIs that you see today aren't actually REST and why Roy is pissed at people trying to call it REST. So we'll take a look at him ranting in a few minutes. Plus, we'll take a look at how he actually goes ahead and defines an API because I was able to find an API that Roy developed. So we'll leave uniform interface to the end. First, let's go over the last two constraints real quick, and then we'll dive into uniform interface. So number one, we have layered system. Layered system is a pretty simple principle. Let's ignore this entire drawing and let's simply talk about what the constraint is. The constraint is, if let's say this over here is the client, the constraint says the client shouldn't be able to know if this over here is the server, or perhaps this is just a gateway and the actual server is over here, or over here, or over here. So the client from its point of view, it interacts with some API, but it doesn't know if behind this API is a layer system or just the actual server. And the last constraint before we dive into the uniform interface is code on demand, which is a pretty weird constraint. So let's look at that. So what Roy says is that if the server has over here some executable code, so let's say that this over here is some executable code, then we'll allow the client to go ahead and fetch this executable code. So let's imagine that this is distributed to various clients and the client will take this executable code and go ahead and simply execute it. As you can see, this is considered an optional constraint and not one of the primary constraints that we talked about. Now, real quick, before we continue, I want to let you know that I just launched my deep dive into domain driven design course in which I walk you through the process of taking any domain, however complex it may be, 
breaking it up, following domain driven design into subdomains and defining the bounded context, and finally designing the underlying aggregates, which you can take and map one to one to the code base. Overall, I now have four courses on Dome Train, getting started and deep dive into both clean architecture and domain driven design. So if you want a step by step guide on how to build projects following clean architecture and domain driven design, then definitely check out those courses. Now back to the video. Okay, so overall, these are the rest constraints. We talked about all of them other than uniform interface. Okay, so uniform interface is a fundamental part in rest, in which we have the following. So let's say we have over here the client and the server, Roy's thinking, how can we have the client decoupled as much as possible from the server? How do we make sure that the servers are free to make changes without breaking all their clients? And then he comes up with the following four things. The first two things have to do with resources. So if you've heard of REST, you probably heard about resources. And the first two are the following, resource identification in requests. And the second one is resource manipulation through representations. Okay, and here's what these two are about. So we have the client working against the server and the server has internally its database, its own representation of all the various entities and whatever logic that it needs. The client can go ahead and request from the server to fetch a resource. And when it does that, then it gives it some identification. So when it's making the request, so over here we have the actual request, then it needs to go ahead and specify, yes, this is the ID of the resource that I now want to fetch. Based on this ID, then the server goes to the database, fetches whatever data that it needs, whatever objects that it has, and it compiles what it defines as the resource that's identified by this ID. So if over here we have something, let's call it A, this A can be based inside the server on three different objects that are X, Y, and Z, and the server is the one that does this conversion internally to what it defined to be the resource, and this is what's returned when the client requests a specific resource by a given ID. Now for the actual ID, then also this has a constraint where this thing must be a URI. So we're talking about the entire URI, not only the ID in the end, but the entire URI, that's the ID of the underlying resource that we're trying to fetch. Okay, so that's number one. So we have URI. The next one is resource manipulation through representations. So like we said over here, we have A. The client requested A and it got it and now it's sitting in the client. If the client wants to do manipulations on A, so update data, delete this resource, et cetera, et cetera, it can do it on this A representation, which like we said, may be different than the X, Y, Z representation that we have in the server. So basically we have the server needing now to respect manipulation on this A, which is a representation of the resource. The next one is self-descriptive messages, where basically when the client makes a request to the server, then as part of the request, then it needs to include all the information needed for the server to be able to parse and understand the message. The last one, here's where things start diverging from what we define as REST. And when I say we, I'm talking about the entire industry of when we go ahead and we call something a REST API to what is actually a REST API. And in a few minutes, we'll see Roy getting pissed at all of us for not following his actual dissertation definition of what REST is. So the last one is hypermedia as the engine of application state. This entire thing is known as hateos. 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 What this bullet point comes to say is the following. The client based only on one initial URI. So we said the URI is an identification for one resource or a collection of resources based on the initial URI. So let's say you have the path just slash the client based on the response should be able to find out on its own all the various actions that it can do on the server. So Roy comes up with this genius idea, and I'm not saying that sarcastically, this idea really is a genius idea in which the server only needs to provide the initial URI. And once the client has this initial URI, then you can go ahead on your own and figure out all the functionality that the server has. This way, the server can go ahead and grow and morph independently. It loosens the coupling between the client and the server by the server dynamically providing to the client what are the various actions that they can take? Now, this is such a crucial part of what 
the original design of REST was all about, that if you look at Roy's website, then you can see that back in October 2008, he literally shames websites for calling themselves REST when they aren't actually RESTful. So you can see that he says, I'm getting frustrated by the number of people calling any HTTP-based interface a REST API. Today's example is social site. And he goes ahead and he gives it a rating for how well it <laughs> implements REST. Now, this entire blog post is all about REST APIs must abide by this constraint to be considered a REST API. If it doesn't have this, then it's not a REST API. That's it. There's no questions about it. This is such a crucial part of being a REST API. And he's trying to scream into the void saying that we need to get this point across where this is a crucial part of the design of a REST API. And then he goes on and says, listen, if you want to call yourself a REST API, then you must abide by these specific rules. Otherwise, you're not a REST API. And my favorite part in this entire article is that he says that all of these are often violated in so-called REST APIs. Please try to adhere to them or choose some other buzzword for your API. Now, you're probably seeing this and thinking, I don't even understand what this constraint actually means. So what we're going to do now is we're going to look at an example of how a REST API should properly be written following all the various constraints. And now hopefully this will be such a bad experience where you'll understand why this isn't being followed today and why what REST is today is a bit different than what it originally was. So as preparing this video, then I was thinking of a good example for a REST API that is written properly. And then I thought this is his personal blog and this is probably also working against a REST API, which led me, and I'll zoom into this, to this over here. Now, the entire premise is that given an initial URI, then we should be able to explore the entire API. So we have this initial URI. Let's go ahead and explicitly say get and make a request and see what we get in the response. Okay, and here's the response. This is not too interesting what we actually have over here. What is interesting is how it works in terms of linking to the other things that you can do from this initial URI. So let's go ahead and collapse some of the things over here. Okay, and now here comes the interesting part. So we're currently on line number 38. And what we see over here is the relative line number from this line. So you can see that this over here is collapsed. And what we have is almost 11,000 lines of JSON, again, 11,000 lines of JSON in which we describe what actions we can take on this API. So you can see that, for example, there's the root and you have get, this is the request that we just made. Now, just so you understand how long this is, this is only line almost 3,000 out of 11,000, where over here we have the definition for each one of the endpoints and then what you can do. So on post, you can get and post, for example. So adding this suffix, we can make a get request and this is supposed to be a valid endpoint. We make the request and we see that we get 200 okay. Now I'm reminding you that this should also contain the information for which actions you can do now. So let's look at one of the items. So over here we have item, it has an ID of 131 and going down to the bottom, then we can see this links meta property. Now here's where it becomes more similar to what you'll actually see in the wild when people really implement rest based on the original constraints. So you'll have a property called underlying links. And then over here, you'll start having links to other things that are related to this specific resource. So for example, we have here self and this over here is the link to the actual post itself that we're looking at. So again, we're looking now at one of the posts within the collection of posts. So over here, we have the unique ID of this post, which is the entire URL. And it ends over here with 131, meaning that if we just add over here 131 and we make a get request, then we expect it to return this individual item. So again, we get 200. Okay. And we can see that now we have only this single item. And down here again, we have the links where this is still the same. So we have the self linking to itself. We have the collection being what we looked at before. So the entire collection of posts. And then we have your other things that are also related to the post, like who is the author of the post and how to retrieve the user. So if you go ahead and make a request to users, 
slash one, then this should give you the author of this post. And I think you get the idea. We have links to all the things that we can do now. Now, just to satisfy your curiosity. So if you want to look at the revisions of each one of the posts, then you must be authorized to do this. And it's great that Roy has authentication authorization set up because otherwise people can abuse a REST API that is properly defined because again, you're giving all the information about all the endpoints that you have via the responses from your API. So as we said, we have a Teos and this is such a crucial part of building a REST API. And if you don't implement this constraint, then Roy doesn't consider your API a RESTful API and you should be choosing a different buzzword for your API. But unfortunately, the post that he wrote about this was in 2008 and today in 2024, then no one knows about this constraint and no one actually implements this constraint in REST APIs. But everyone continues calling their APIs a REST API, meaning that if it didn't make a difference in 2008 when he asked people to do it, then now the ship has sailed long, long ago and people aren't going to be implementing this constraint. Now it makes sense that with time, this didn't become such a crucial part of REST APIs because versioning became something standard. Public documentation for your API also became something standard and understanding what your API is capable of doing via the root URI became redundant. And as you can see, it can be a lot of information. So in Roy's case, in a small website, it was 11,000 lines of descriptions of all the various endpoints that exist and what you can do starting from the initial URI. So the next time you're on LinkedIn or in a conference and someone looks at you and he's like, that's not a REST API since it doesn't implement Hateos. Then you can tell them to, first of all, relax with the attitude. And second of all, no one implements it today. And it's okay, REST just became something a bit different. And today, the recommendation for how to build a REST API is a bit different than what it was originally intended. Now, what we'll do in the next video is we'll look at what I consider to be best practices when designing a REST API, and we'll define the REST API or the initial draft of the REST API for one review. And we'll also talk about what run review is and what is the domain that we're going to be working within. And then we're going to be talking about a lot more interesting topics as the series progresses. This is just a warm up towards what we're going to be talking about later. So that's it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. It was entertaining or somewhat entertaining and you learned something new. Make sure to smash the like button, smash the subscribe button, and I'll see you in the next one.